Hi everyone, welcome to the fifth session of the month of evolution. Uh, this year we are holding the annual evolution days online. Moreover, we are enlarging our event both by extending duration to a month and going international in collaboration with every margin. We are so happy to share this period with you. Month of Evolution started on 12th of February, which is Darwin Day, and it will end on 13th of March. We hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions during the presentation, just write them to chat. When the presentation is over, our team will ask your questions on your behalf. This year's event is far more meaningful due to the circumstances our university is in. At this point, we feel the need to inform you. We are standing with our friends who got arrested during the protest against the non-democratic vector appointment that happened on 2nd of January. We don't accept, we don't give up, and we won't bow down. As well as our professors who are also protesting this de decision, exhibiting academic attitude. In any case, we will continue to strive to bring science to you. As Boğaziçi University Science Club, our goal is to facilitate access to science and accurate information to spread scientific thinking, hereby to contribute to scientific enlightenment, which is our common dream as we can. Today we are with Dr. Miller. He is a role model for us because of his powerful stand with science and his efforts for evolution. Dr. Miller's contribution to science are not limited to his studies and books. In the early 2000s, he resisted anti-evolutionist politicians and educators by opposing the inclusion of the intelligent design argument in the curriculum of Ohio and supported the teaching of evolution. He has been outspoken in explaining and defending the theory of evolution and in this regard, he has confronted anti-evolutionists in many lawsuits and panels. Thank you once again for making this event happen in these dark days, especially in Boğaziçi University. Now I want to give floor to Char Mert Bakırcı. Hello. Oh, I'm not focused. There you go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, it's so great to see you here. Uh, today is a very special day for us because um, when we were just beginning in 2010, uh, when we were just about to... Uh, like figure out what we will be as Evrimaji, what we will do. Uh, back in the times when we were in uh, Middle East Technical University, uh, uh, as a part of biology and genetic society, uh, which has been holding, uh, as it was called back in the time, National Evolution Conference, um, we joined them to, or we were formed as a part of them, to make this event even bigger, access more people, and bring evolution to the uh, public much more effectively. And that's where Every Maja was born. And on the very first year of us, but the sixth time of that event, um, uh, Dr. Kenneth Miller uh, was kind enough to join us, fly all the way to Turkey. <laughs> and at the time, you know, as a um, third year uh, uh college student, I had the opportunity to drive to the airport, pick him up. And I mean, you can imagine how how crazy it is. I am a student of uh, mechanical engineering, technically, forming a club called Evrimaja, and then uh, bringing one of our idols in evolutionary biology, or, you know, having the opportunity to pick him up from the airport. You can think how shaky I, <laughs> I was at the time. And Dr. Miller has been a great company um, throughout his uh, visit. He made us more comfortable than we made him, probably. Uh, and then uh, it it was it was a great event. And after that, that and this is crucial, he has never really cut contact with us. See, it, it, this is not common, as many of you would know. This is not very common. So we you know, emailed back and forth, not frequently maybe, but still. And after 10 years, now that we're celebrating our 10th anniversary, uh, being one of the largest, uh, well, the most visited popular science organization in Turkey now, way ahead of where we were 10 years ago, um, Dr. Miller will be again with us today. And I will leave to the floor to him. Uh, just as a reminder, we will take your questions, as Berina said, 
And then uh, I will also ask him a few questions as a mini interview that I prepared and we will catch up after 10 years, let's say. So Dr. Miller, please, this uh, floor is yours. All right. Hi there. I hope very much you can see my screen. If you can confirm that, that'd be terrific. Um, not yet. Did you share your screen? Yes, yes I, did. I did. I'll try it again. You guys, okay. If you can just reshare. Oh yes, now we can see it. Let's see that. How's that? Perfect. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, very good. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, first of all, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this event. It's a great honor, uh, and uh, I uh, I thank everyone involved in this and I wish uh, I wish your organization all the best. Um, as you've just heard, uh, almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, I had the, the, the honor uh, to participate in the Tree of Evolution uh, conference. It was in Ankara at Middle Eastern Technical University. Uh, here was a side trip, uh, one of the great highlights uh, to visit this wonderful Ataturk Memorial in the capital. And I still have very, very fond memories of my trip to Turkey. And I hope very much in the future uh, to be able to come again. Uh, so again, I want to thank everyone who was involved then and now. Uh, in my own scientific background, I am a cellular biologist. I work with the electron microscope on the structure of biological membranes. And I publish in journals like Cell and the Journal of Cell Biology. But I have an interest in evolution, as you have heard. And I have actually written three books for general audiences on evolution. One is about evolution and religion called Finding Darwin's God. One you might say is about evolution and politics called Only a Theory. And my most recent book is called The Human Instinct how we evolve to have reason, consciousness, and free will. How did I get interested in evolution? Uh, that's a very long and involved story. But among other things, a former student of mine convinced me that we should work together to write a textbook for American high schools. And our textbooks immediately became the best sellers in the United States used in most American high schools. And of course, those textbooks had a very strong treatment of evolution. We quickly discovered, and here are uh, some of the pages from our textbook. We very quickly discovered that in many places in the United States, evolution was controversial. This surprised us because evolution is really the central theory of biology. Nonetheless, and you can see some headlines here from American newspapers in the state of Texas, one of our largest and most influential states, that there was a serious debate as to whether evolution should actually be taught in the schools. And this is still true today. Even in 2021, evolution remains a controversial subject in American schools. Now, interestingly, American attitudes towards evolution have begun to progress recently. But as you can see from the graph that you see here, the United States is near the bottom in terms of the number of people who accept the theory of evolution. And I must say that I feel a kinship with Turkey for the very simple reason, as you can see in the bottom of this slide, that the uh, among developed nations in Asia, in the European Union and so forth, the United States and Turkey rank last among developed nations in terms of public acceptance of the theory of evolution. Clearly we have work to do in my country and in yours. Now, all of this hit home in uh, 2005 when a school board in a small American town in the state of Pennsylvania 
decided to implement a so-called intelligent design curriculum. And in fact, uh, you should know that education in the United States is largely a local matter. Our national government does not dictate the curriculum. Local communities can decide that. What happened then was that 11 parents of students in the school went to court uh, suing their own school board under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, which not only guarantees religious freedom, but also says that the government cannot impose religion. They recognized that intelligent design was in fact a religious idea and not a scientific one. What happened then was a seven week trial and I had the privilege of being the first witness in that trial. And in the news article here, you can see a photograph as I walked into court and the sketch that you see in the left-hand side of the slide is from the NBC television network. Cameras are not allowed in federal court. So an artist sat there and drew me on the stand and those are my textbooks actually piled on the desk in front of the attorneys and the judge. Well, we won the case. An intelligent design was disqualified as a curriculum because it was inherently religious. But nonetheless, the battle, you might say, goes on. And one can ask, given such strong resistance to the teaching of evolution, is the case for evolution a strong one? Or is evolution, as the cover of this book suggests, nothing but a lie? Well, obviously, I think the case is strong, but I'd like to explain why, and I want to start with Earth history. The geological ages, which you can see in this cartoon, were established well before Charles Darwin was born, and they show that life has changed over time. The people who did this in the 18th and early 19th century were the pioneers of the science of geology. And they include the French paleontologist, Georges Cuvier, as well as the two British pioneers of geology, James Hutton and Charles Lyell. So what, these, uh, what the fossil record in the geologic ages show is first of all, that life was not created in a single burst, but appeared gradually over time. So that throughout the fossil record, new life forms appear and older forms vanished into extinction. That was clear even before Charles Darwin was born. However, we can ask a question. Do the geologic ages represent a genuine timeline? Are they really a, a, a sequential record from the past? Well, um, uh, the way in which this was done, way in which this was proven, was had to do with the discovery of radioactivity by Henri Becquel, a French scientist. And radioactivity made it possible to test whether the geologic ages were real. So the discovery of radioactivity put all of geology to the test. How did it fare? It passed. The geologic ages turned out to correlate with a great age for the earth in the order of tens and hundreds of millions of years. So the ages were authentic. How certain can we be that this analysis is correct? Well, age determinations are made by geologists with multiple cross-checked methods using different isotopes. One of the most powerful techniques is the rubidium strontium technique. It is self-checking and it makes no assumptions about starting conditions other than using the laws of physics and chemistry. 
Now we can ask, what about fossils? This is the cover of a report by the most prestigious scientific organization in the United States, the National Academy of Sciences. And what they wrote is that so many intermediate forms have been discovered between fish and amphibians, amphibians and reptiles, and reptiles and mammals, that it is often difficult to identify where the transition occurs from one species to another. That is exactly what we would expect from evolution. Now, I'd like to give you a specific example that I find very striking. Whales and dolphins, swimming mammals, appear roughly 55 million years ago in the fossil record. Where do they come from? For much of geologic history, this was a, uh, uh, an unanswered question. And the critics of evolution said that intermediate forms between land mammals and swimming mammals were missing. And that was a problem with evolution. Well, uh, that argument vanished about 30 years ago when scientists first began to dig in certain areas uh, in Egypt and also in the Indus River Valley. And they were able to show fossils of whale ancestors. The most famous of these is called Ambulocetus natans. In Latin, that means the walking whale who swims. And this organism basically was a perfect intermediate form documenting how whales evolved from land mammals. And we now have a step-by-step -step genealogy that shows quite dramatically how swimming mammals first developed. In fact, even the slide I am showing here is an oversimplification. We now have more than 20 intermediate forms between land mammals and swimming mammals documenting how this evolutionary process took place. And what you see here is an article from a scientific colleague of mine, Hans Tewissen, and the headline reads, Whale Childs as Whale Origins as a Poster Child for Macroevolution, meaning whales are an excellent example of evolutionary transition. But I don't want to stop there. I live on the coast of the state of Massachusetts in the United States. The fishing industry is very important where I live. In the 19th century, part of that was the whaling industry. And in fact, New Bedford, Massachusetts, near where I live, was the home of the American whaling industry in the 19th century. Well, you may know, if you have studied mammal biology, that there are two categories of whales. Whales with teeth, toothed whales, and baleen whales. In this photograph, you can see the mouth of a baleen whale. Baleen is this, this lacy substance that the whales use to filter small organisms from the ocean in order to eat them. Well, baleen whales first appeared about 30 million years ago. If they evolved, as we believe they did, you can predict that somewhere between 20 and 30 million years ago, there should have been an intermediate between a baleen whale, shown on the left, and a toothed whale, like the orca shown on the right. That's a prediction of evolution. Well, here is a diagram showing the two major categories of whales, Odontocetus, the toothed whales at the top, and Mysticetes, the baleen whales at the bottom. In 2008, exactly such an intermediate fossil was found. And in fact, you can see photographs of the skull and the teeth of that fossil right here. And what this shows are grooves with baleen arrows adjacent to teeth. And as it turns out, three species of fossil whales have now been found that are intermediate because they have both teeth 
and slits for baleen. However, that is not the most dramatic confirmation of evolution. Here it is. From these fossils, another prediction was made, and that is that baleen whales would retain dead or inactivated genes for the enamel that would be part of teeth, even though they do not have teeth. And lo and behold, they do. It turns out, and you can read part of the summary in this scientific report, that baleen whales lack teeth, but they contain genetic evidence of the fact that they in fact evolved from organisms that once did have teeth. What does all of this mean? Uh, what this means, first of all, is that the fossil record is abundant with transitional forms that document the origin of new species. And number two, that novel organs, and baleen is a novel organ, novel organs can and do develop by means of evolution. This is not the only example, and because of time, I'm not going to go in in detail to another very famous fossil. This is called Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik is a perfect intermediate form between fish and amphibians. So in short, when we look at the history of life in fossils, what we find is a record that documents evolution. Now, I am a cellular biologist, and therefore I am less interested in fossils than I am in DNA and RNA. So it is only fair to ask, can we see the results of evolution in the genome? And I'm going to give you two compelling examples. The embryos of placental mammals, animals like us, like dogs, like cats, build a empty yolk sac in their embryonic stages. And you can see a diagram of the yolk sac. And in the upper corner, that's an actual photograph of a developing human embryo with a yolk sac attached. But that yolk sac is empty. And the reason for that is that placental mammals do not produce eggs with yolk. We make a yolk sac that is completely empty. Now, why do placental mammals produce a yolk sac with no yolk? Well, the answer is because mammals evolved from animals that did produce yolk-containing eggs. And therefore, the yolk sac is a remnant, a, a trace of our evolutionary past. Now, that is simply the morphology of, of uh, embryonic development. However, here is an insight. If the ancestors of mammals once had yolk in their eggs, it means that the mammalian genome once had the genes for the yolk protein vitellogenin. And we can ask the following question. Could those genes be in the human genome somewhere, even though we never use them? It turns out that the answer is yes. The human genome does contain two, I'm sorry, three genes for the yolk protein vitellogenin, even though we never produce yolk. We have in our genome non functional remnants of all three yolk protein genes VIT1, VIT2, and VIT3. What does this indicate? Well, the great writer and scientist Stephen Jay Gould called this a senseless sign of history. And he noted that Darwin said, if organisms have a history, then ancestral stages should leave remnants behind. Things that don't make sense in present terms, the useless, the odd, the peculiar, the incongruous, these are signs of history. They supply proof that the world was not made in its present form. When history perfects, it covers its own tracks. Now to many people, what matters is human evolution. And here I show two uh, fairly recent fossil finds 
of pre-human ancestors, both of them from the continent of Africa. Now, in recent years, I should say recent decades, so many pre-human fossils have been found that we can now uh, uh, sort of tie them together into a tree of evolution. And when you do that, and the human ancestors are shown on the left, they look remarkably like Charles Darwin's own sketch of what an evolutionary tree would look like. And it turns out Darwin got it right. This is indeed what the pattern of evolution looks like for most organisms, including for us. Now, many people would say that there is a gap between humans and all other primates. There is a missing link that no one has ever found. Well, a scientific friend of mine, Nick Matsky, whose picture you can see in the corner, decided to use the data in this paper to analyze the brain size of every single pre-human specimen that has ever been found. And when he did that, he graphed the size of the brain, the cranial capacity on one axis, and the age of the fossil in millions of years on the other. And what he was able to show quite convincingly was that there is no gap between humans and non-human primates. When we look back in the past, we see an evolutionary pathway leading directly to us, and we have intermediate forms on every step of the way. Now, I said before that I was more interested in RNA and DNA than I was in fossils, and that's true. So I want to show you, I think, an even more compelling example. Um, studies of primate genomes confirm common ancestry, that we have common ancestry with organisms like gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans. However, there is something interesting here. We humans have 46 chromosomes. All the other great apes have 48. So if we share common ancestry with them, how is that possible? Did we lose a pair of chromosomes as we evolved? Well, any geneticist would tell you that's not possible. The only possible explanation is that a chromosome, two chromosomes, that are still separate in those primates must have fused together to form a single chromosome in us. And that would have reduced us from 24 pairs of chromosomes to 23. But here's why evolution is science and not just a guess. This makes a testable prediction. If these organisms that you see share common ancestors with us, then the human genome must contain a fused chromosome. Now, how would we find that fused chromosome? It turns out that it's actually quite easy. I've diagrammed two chromosomes here. Near the end of each chromosome is a very special DNA sequence called the telomere sequence, and I have colored that in in blue. Near the center of every chromosome is another region called the centromere, and I have colored that in in red. If two chromosomes fused to form a single chromosome, what that would produce is telomere DNA in the middle of the chromosome, where it does not belong, and two centromeres instead of one. You can then ask, do we have such a chromosome? Well, the answer to that is yes, we do. It is human chromosome number two. And chromosome number two shows the exact point at which this fusion took place. In fact, the base count is 114,455,823. That is the exact point where two chromosomes in one of our ancestors fuse together to form a single chromosome. Now, we can go even further than that, and I have gone to the Human Genome Database to show you human chromosome number two and the two parts of that chromosome with the fusion site, and they correspond 
to what we used to call orangutan or gorilla chromosome 13 and chromosome 12. We now call them 2A and 2B because those chromosomes correspond so precisely to human chromosome number two. And I zeroed in on the data bank, and you can see right there is where the fusion site is. And we can look and identify the fusion site. There are four genes to the left of it and four to the right. Those exact four genes are on the end of one of the primate chromosomes and the other four on the end of the other primate chromosome. And even when we look at the DNA base sequence, we can see the exact point where the chromosome fusion took place. This means, and DNA sequences are not theories or hypotheses. DNA sequences are facts. What this means basically is we have conclusive evidence for our common ancestry with these other primates. I have pointed this out in one of my books, Only a Theory, but other authors have pointed it out too. Molecular studies provide conclusive evidence for the natural origins of our species. And that is the point I wish to make today. So summing up what I have just said about the evidence, the antiquity of rocks and fossils is confirmed by radiometric physics. The history of the earth reveals a pattern of change and extinction. Transitional forms confirm descent with modification, which is the word that Darwin used to describe evolution. Molecular biology reveals how genetic changes produce new genes and novel structures. And finally, genomic studies confirm the evolutionary origin of modern species. And one of those species whose evolutionary origins they confirm is us. Now, what does this mean for American society and for Turkish society? I think it means the following. And that is at a time of global crisis. And that crisis involves climate change. That crisis involves the pandemic. We need more science, not less, to solve our problems and save our species. This is true for every nation in the world, that science is the answer to the problems we, we face. And the lesson I would also draw from this, and I draw this not from just my own experience in the United States, which is predominantly a Christian country, but also from my experience in the Middle East, where Islam is the prevailing religion. And that is, it is vital to encourage all people, including people of faith, to embrace science and science education. And that is why the work of the Tree of Evolution Project, which you are engaged in in the country of Turkey, is so vital, not just to your nation, but to the world itself. And I want to conclude by quoting from two scientists. One of them is a, uh, a European scientist who came to the United States during World War II and made his career here. His name is Theodosius Dobzhansky, and he is probably the greatest evolutionary geneticist of the 20th century. Now, Dobzhansky, being an evolutionary biologist, one might suspect was an atheist. However, that is not the case. He, in fact, in fact was a profoundly religious person. He wrote a very famous article. Um, and the title in English means nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Evolution is the key to understanding biology. And in that article, he wrote the following. The organic diversity of life becomes reasonable and understandable if the creator created the living world not by caprice or by intelligent design, but by evolution propelled by natural selection. He then said, it is wrong 
to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive alternatives. I, and Dobzhansky was a Christian, I am a creationist and an evolutionist. What did he mean by that? He wrote that evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. Creation is not an event that happened in 4004 BC. It is a process that began some 10 billion years ago and still is underway today. And I'd like to close and then take some questions uh, with a quote from the final sentence of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And at the end of this great book, Darwin wanted people to know that he did not view the idea of evolution as demeaning or degrading. Instead, he wrote the following. He said, there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while this planet has gone cycling on, according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most wonderful and most beautiful, have been and are being evolved. I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. Um, I thought I would close with a picture of two remarkable uh, images from antiquity, one man-made and the other one biological. That is our current textbook that is now widely used in American schools. And on the right, that is the book that I wrote many years ago. Uh, uh, the subtitle is A Scientist's Search for Common Ground between God and evolution. Uh, I have a Twitter account, Kenneth R. Miller. Uh, Kenneth Miller is a very common name in, in the English language. So I always use my middle initial, which is an R. And I also have a very simple email address, which is simply my name and my university, which is called Brown University in the United States. Thank you once again for your attention. And I uh, would be very happy to take some questions. And I think in order to do that, I have to stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. It was a very impressive and very pleasant uh, presentation that raised excellent questions. Um, our team has edited the questions asked so far. Uh, by the way, you can still ask questions. We will forward them if the time remains. Uh, so if Dr. Miller and the questions team are ready, we can begin our question and answer session. Okay, I think I'm starting. Uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I you. think it was very interesting. Uh, my question is something personal, actually. Uh, you have defended you have defended evolution uh, in public education in many panels and even in courts. Uh, how did you feel while fighting for science and evolution? How did I feel? I, uh, the answer is yeah. I felt I felt very good. And what I mean by that is that science is a very delicate institution. Um, the scientific view of the universe is only the product of the last few centuries. And it has many opponents. There are many nations historically in which science has been suppressed, ignored, um, or simply pushed aside. And one of the most important things to me, living in a country that aspires towards being a democracy, and that's what I would always say about the United States of America, uh, we aspire to being a perfect democracy. We are not, but we keep working at it, is that in order to thrive, science requires popular support, that people understand it, that they appreciate it, and that they are willing to defend the rights of scientists to investigate and to publish whatever they find. There are all too many societies in which that freedom to do research and publish is not there. Um, we owe what we have in the modern world to advances in science and technology. 
So even though I was criticized, of course, by many people for standing up for the teaching of evolution, uh, for that matter, also the teaching of climate change in our schools, I was happy to do so because I thought that what I was doing was helping to defend the integrity of science. And I have to say that members of the scientific community increasingly appreciate those of us who are willing to take a public stance defending science. So I felt I was uh, performing a useful task for my colleagues and also for my country. I'm doing it now and I will continue to do it in the future. Okay, I guess my turn. Um, thank you for being here with us, Professor uh, Dr. Miller. Uh, it was an informative and clear presentation, by the way. Uh, there's also a question I would like to ask. Uh, what determines the difference uh, between adaptation and evolution? The difference between, if I understood correctly, adaptation and evolution? And evolution. Yes. Okay, very good. Well, um, before, well before Charles Darwin, biologists were impressed by the fact that many organisms are extremely well adapted to their environment. In other words, some organisms are really efficient predators. So think of you know, the great cats, lions, tigers, jaguars, and so forth. These are extraordinarily capable predators. On the other hand, the organisms which they hunt, and you can think of gazelles and antelopes and deer, those organisms are also well adapted. In many cases, their coloration gives them camouflage. They have great speed and they have good instincts to evade predators. Organisms that live in the desert. And of course, we have examples of that, not just in Turkey, but especially in the United States. We have a large desert region in the American West. Despite the hot, dry conditions, there are organisms like various species of cactus that thrive despite the lack of water and despite the extreme temperature precisely because they have adaptations that enable them to take water directly out of the atmosphere, to avoid the loss of water, and to basically adapt the process of photosynthesis to make it more efficient. So these adaptations are things that we see in just about every successful living organism. So the question, and this was true at the beginning of the 19th century, is how do these adaptations arise? Now, there was a great French uh, biologist, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who thought that these adaptations arose out of what he called use and disuse, which is to say, uh, let's say a hunting animal like a tiger got to be strong and fast, because it used those attributes over and over again. And by using them, somehow that information could be passed along to the next generation so that the next generation of tigers would be even stronger and even faster. Now, Lamarck was not correct. Uh, inheritance genetics does not work that way. What Charles Darwin did was to build upon Lamarck's idea by developing a theory of evolution by natural selection. And natural selection basically explains where these adaptations come from. And that is they come from what he called the struggle for existence, allowing those organisms that were the best adapted to their own particular environments to survive, to reproduce, and to have a number of offspring that was greater than poorly adapted animals were. So that combination of natural selection plus a constant input of new characteristics by mutation and genetic recombination into the population is what drove evolution. So adaptations are real. Evolution is the process that produces those adaptations. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, one pleasure. of our participants asked another question. Uh, with today's technology, DNA can be changed before a baby is born. 
how will this affect the process of evolution? Ah, DNA can be changed before a baby is born. Um, as you may know, um, about three years ago, a scientist in China announced that he had used the CRISPR technique, which is a gene editing technique, to alter the DNA of two unborn baby girls. And when he did this, he altered a particular gene on the surfaces of cells in the immune system. And this gene produces a protein to which HIV, the AIDS virus, attaches. So he argued that making this genetic change was a good thing because these little girls who were born three years ago, these little girls would now grow up and they would never be able to contract AIDS, the disease AIDS. So the HIV virus could not affect them. Here's the problem. And that is at some point as these young girls grow up, someone will have to explain to them that before they were born, their genetic information was altered without their consent and without knowledge of what the long-term implications of that modification would be. The fact that it is scientifically possible to do something does not automatically mean that it should be done. And in this particular case, um, I regard the dignity of the individual human being as being paramount. And altering someone's genetic information without their consent, I think is inappropriate and immoral. So I think that we in the scientific community, and I think popular culture in general, I think should draw a line at the genetic modification of human beings for whatever purpose until we understand more about what the consequences of these changes should be. So yes, we can alter DNA before a baby is born. No, I don't think we should do this, at least certainly not at this time. Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, there is one last question that we would like to address. Uh, since there are many evidence supporting the theory of evolution, how can people still be opposed to evolution re religiously? Do they have any evidence that they rely on? How do you see evolution in society in the future? Well, um, you're asking me, how can anyone deny the evidence for evolution? On one hand, I might say, I don't know because I think the evidence is so strong. But I have encountered many people uh, in many settings, in the courtroom, in public debate, and in simply discussion with my friends and neighbors who resist the acceptance of evolution. And I would say they resist it for one of two reasons. One is they have been told by religious authorities that evolution contradicts their sacred scriptures, whether that is in the Jewish Torah, whether that is in the sacred Quran, or whether that is in the Holy Bible. And because their religious belief is so important, um, they simply say they will not consider the evidence. The other line of reasoning, which I have encountered, is that what evolution does is to demean us as human beings. What evolution says is that we are, uh, you and I are simply animals like any other animal. And therefore we are entitled to no special dignity as a human being. Um, these are the arguments that one hears. And there are many fictitious arguments as well. Uh, quite frankly, falsehoods that are made up to argue that evolution relies on flimsy data, that scientists falsify information, or that scientists have a pre-commitment against religion and therefore are determined to use evolution as a weapon against it. I reject all of those arguments, and I have tried to explain to people um, that it is possible to be a person of faith to be a faithful Muslim, to be a faithful Christian, 
to be a faithful Jew and still accept the theory of evolution. And I think a recognition of that fact is important, especially in highly religious countries like Turkey and like the United States. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Dr. Miller again for his answer to our audience questions. I'm sure everyone watching the stream finds it valuable being able to ask him questions and learn from revealing answers. Uh, now our dear mentor, Char Mart Bakurji, will make an interview with the estimate Dr. Kent Miller. Right. Hopefully this will be fun. Um, I couldn't miss the opportunity to um, interview you after 10 years. So I'll just take a little bit more of your time if that's okay. Sure. So first of all, after 10 years, it's just great to see you again. Oh, um, I'm, you so I'm, I'm delighted, by the way, at the wonderful career, the scientific career you have built for yourself. And I think that's terrific. So it was a real you. pleasure to see you again. You're such a special person and I'll give you a direct example of it. As you were speaking, I was checking comments to the um, live and I can't do what you're doing. So I apologize from the audience. Um, you obviously, I don't think you normally speak this slow, but how you separate the words to make sure our audience, majority of which might not be great with English for understandable reasons. Um, everybody was saying how easy it is to understand what you're saying and how you're making a deliberate effort, effort to, <laughs> to continue that. It is a hard task, but it shows how a great educator you are. So well, want... first of all, first of all, yeah. my compliments, my compliments to the audience for having mastered two languages. Um, the, your English, obviously, all of you uh, are much better in English than I am in Turkish. <laughs> uh, I have been I have been able I have been able only to learn one other language and that is German. So ich habe Deutsch in der Universität gelernt. Um, but uh, so I am conversant in German, and I know how hard I had to work for that purpose. Um, but again, I I I thank you very much actually for the convenience of being able to make the presentation in English, and I also thank you personally for putting. <laughs> for translating much of the text on my slides into Turkish, yeah, this, uh, which well, I hope- Well, students did the main job. I just edited it a little uh, to reflect, I think, what yeah. you were trying to say, um, yeah. since I'm a little more uh, accustomed yeah, so, to it. So, so I am very grateful to that, and hopefully that also helped the audience. Yes, I hope so too, and thank you so much. And I will ask you this. As a researcher, your researcher aspect, Uh, what are you doing in recent times? We uh, haven't talked about that as much. Are you still uh, doing active research or are you doing more science communication and education? Well, well, I, well, I hate to tell you this, but I'm actually in the process of gradually closing down my laboratory. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that is I have reached a certain age um, where I am approaching uh, retirement from the university. Um, what I will continue to do even after I retire, which will probably be in about two years. Um, what I will continue to do is to write uh, and to travel and to speak uh, as an advocate for science, as an advocate for evolution. So I will very much continue doing that. But knowing that I was getting close to retirement, I thought it was not fair to bring any other students into my laboratory So I'm gradually sort of winding everything down. So I do not have any wonderful research breakthroughs to tell you about. <laughs> That's all right. That's all. You do a lot. So uh, and actually speaking of what you have done so far uh, for science, for science education in the past, say, two decades, one or two decades, do you think the acceptance for evolution has increased in the American society? You can't speak for Turkish society, of course, because those slides that you're using and that I've been using too actually belong to 2006 and 2008, I believe that was published. Correct, science correct. New scientists. So it's been 14 to 16 years since then. I hope what we're doing works. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Well, um, I could have used more recent data for the United States. 
Um, and the more recent data for the United States shows that acceptance of evolution is increasing quite dramatically. And now there are a majority of Americans, about 60%, that accept the theory of evolution. So that, that is progress. But even more important than that, and this is from a survey done from an organization called the Pew Foundation, and this was done two years ago, the percentage of Americans between the ages of 18 and 35 who accept the theory of evolution is roughly 75%. So that is close to the highest numbers that you might see in Europe or the Scandinavian countries. So what this tells me is that especially among younger people who have been educated in the last 10 or 15 years, the acceptance of evolution is increasing dramatically. And I think that's a good thing. I wish that I had more current uh, uh, data for Turkey, uh, but under current conditions, it might be difficult to do that survey. Yeah. <laughs> well, Pew should do something about it for sure. Or, I mean, we we will try to do something too, because it hasn't sure. been measured since like uh, 15, for the past 15 years or Correct. so. Yeah. I'm really curious how, how it changed. By the way, before I move on to my next question, I want to uh, show you some love. Uh, from our audience. I don't, you can see the screen probably. I'll show you some <laughs> comments. Uh, <laughs> they're sending you hearts. Um, you're in, they're saying that your English is very clear and easy to understand. Uh, wonderful person, John said. It's our pleasure to listen. Oh, some people were saying that. What? 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 Closing your lab? You're young. Come on. <laughs> they were saying <laughs> it's too young. You're so young to shut down your lab. So. I don't know. Some people aren't happy with that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, you know, it's uh, the, uh, uh, th there's a couple things. One is um, I, uh, I will be 73 years old this year. And um, I think it's uh, appropriate for me. Uh, it, well, in, in American universities, I don't know if this is true in Turkish universities, but when an American professor retires, we don't say they are retired. They say you become professor emeritus, mm, yeah. which means they stop paying you, but you, <laughs> but you still get to be at the university to use an office. And if you'd like to, you can continue to teach. And, and I will probably, I will probably do all of those things. So no, I'm, I'm not running out of energy, but I think it would be appropriate to allow my department to hire a new cell biology researcher. Uh, in my field, um, uh, uh, you know, especially since most of my energies right now are going into writing and public speaking. Yes, that and that is that is wonderful. Of course, I mean, uh, sometimes we we unfortunately see that scientists just bury their heads too much into research and forget about the public. And I mean, that's that's probably the worst thing a science community can do. So what you've done is uh, just amazing. And speaking of that, uh, thinking about your life. I'm curious if there has been a like a turning point in your life which made you okay this like hardened me or changed me and made me Kenneth Miller has there been anything like that in your life I'm not sure there has been um and 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 I'll tell you the reason why um my uh my father um grew up in 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 southern indiana which is a the state in the middle of the United States. Um, he was a very, very bright student, but just as he thought about going to college, World War II began. So my father, like 30 million other Americans, went into the military and he fought in World War II. He um, was not able to go to college. Uh, fortunately, the army trained him in a division known as the Signal Corps. So he learned electronics and radio and television technology. Um, he got a job um, for basically the telephone company after the war. Um, I was born right after the war. So I am a, what we call a baby boomer. Yes. Because there was, a, you know, in, in, when the war ended, all these men came back from the war. They all got married and they all had babies. So there's an enormous number of births. Uh, right around the year I was born. So he had two sons. Uh, and then I think when I was five or six, um, my dad decided he always wished he had gone to college. 
So we had a wonderful piece of law in the United States called the GI Bill. GI is slang for a military man. And it basically allowed all of the veterans of World War II to go to college almost for free. So he went to the state university in New Jersey where we live. And what I remember is, and he was studying electronics. So I, what I remember as a kid is my dad was at home. He'd have all these textbooks on physics and electronics and even astronomy. And I couldn't understand all of them, but I loved turning through them. And so from a very early age, and I was seven, eight, nine, I was just interested in science and technology. And as soon as I found out what it meant to be a scientist, I thought, wow, that is just the coolest thing that anybody could do. The other thing is the town, the city in which I grew up, it has, it's called Rawway, New Jersey, which I'm sure means nothing to anyone listening. <laughs> Uh, Rawway, New Jersey was also the home of the Merck Pharmaceutical Company, one of the largest research drug companies in the world. So right in my own hometown, there were hundreds of biologists and biochemists who were trying to cure diseases, develop drugs. And when I saw that, I thought, that's exactly what I want to do. And in fact, if, if I, I could dig through my computer, I could show you a picture of myself on my 11th birthday, sitting in the basement of my house with my chemistry set and a very, a very small micro, uh, microscope. So I thought of myself as a scientist from the time I was 10 or 11 years old and never wavered. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I wanted to do when I was in high school. That's what I went to college to try to do. In college, I discovered that uh, uh, that graduate school was meant for me. And later on in grad school, I discovered that I like to teach. Uh, and that's why I decided to become a university professor rather than go into a pure research institution. So, you know, I'm embarrassed to tell you this because most people have a story as something that changed their life. But in my case, I just felt like it was, man, it was straight ahead. Well, maybe your dad's decision made you who you are because if he didn't want to go to oh, school. I, oh, maybe, a, 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 oh absolutely. I, yeah, I, I owe a great deal to my dad for you know, sort of opening that up to me. And he didn't tell me, as a little kid, he didn't tell me, don't look at my books. He said, sure. And he tried to explain things to me. So I, I owe him for that. Okay, perfect. And that was a really good answer, actually, because um, in our life, sometimes we just don't have a single thing that made us us. It's a process, so yes, uh, that's an answer for sure. Um, to just add a question from our audience, uh, you have given us a wonderful quote when you last came uh, to Turkey. So I want to ask you again, since unfortunately those questions haven't disappeared, um, if evolution is so certain, why is it still not a law, but you're still calling it a theory? So <laughs> uh, shortly, not without going into too much detail, how would you respond to that? Well, I would, I would describe it this way, and that is, um, believe it or not, theory is a higher level of understanding than law. And, and let me explain what I mean by talking about physics, okay? So, for example, um, let's take what is well regarded as a law in physics, which is Newton's law of gravitation. And the Newton's law of gravitation is that the gravitational force on two objects is equal to the mass of one object multiplied by the mass of the other, the, the square of the distance between them times the gravitational constant. So that is a law and that's how you can figure out how strong the attraction is, for example, between the earth and the moon, or for that matter, how strong the attraction is between this object and the earth. You just plug in the masses, multiply by the gravitational constant, and divide by the square of the distance between them. So the farther apart they are, you know, there it is. So that's the law. But what the law doesn't explain is why that works. It doesn't explain what the value of the gravitational constant is. It seems to be arbitrary. And above all, it doesn't explain to you why gravity exists. 
That um, it requires what's called a theory. And by theory, I don't mean a guess or a hunch or an idea. By theory, I mean a system of testable explanations. So the explanation we use for gravity today is Einstein's theory of general relativity. And general relativity, it's called a theory, but it has been validated over and over and over again. And that's the difference between law and theory. Now, one of my friends is fond of saying, um, theories in science never become facts. Rather, theories exist to explain facts. So let's take atomic theory. Um, in physics, why do we call this topic atomic theory? Is it because it's just a theory that atoms exist? No, of course not. We know that atoms exist. What atomic theory does is to explain hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, observed facts about the nature of matter and explain laws that we put into the nature of matter. That's what atomic theory does. What about evolutionary theory? What evolutionary theory does is to take hundreds of thousands of facts about DNA sequences, about the structures of organisms, about the fossil record, about the history of life on Earth, and put all of those facts into an explanatory framework. And therefore, the word theory is appropriate, not because it's tentative, but because it pulls together so many facts and so many principles. That's, yeah, that's basically how we explain it uh, here in Turkey too, because it is what <laughs> what it is. But no matter how many times we explain this from, you know, millions of different angles, I feel like the question never disappears, which is okay, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I, I put one other thing, okay? Nothing in science is ever final, nothing. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that there is nothing in science that is not subject to potential disproof if evidence is discovered that contradicts it. Ever since Darwin published the theory of evolution in 1859, I cannot think of a single scientific theory that people have worked harder to disprove <laughs> yeah. in that almost 170 years And despite that, what has happened is that the evidence for that theory has only grown stronger and stronger and stronger. Darwin didn't know about genetics, but genetics supports evolution. Darwin didn't have a science of biochemistry, but biochemistry supports evolution. Darwin didn't know about molecular biology, but molecular biology supports evolution. And finally, what very little was known about the fossil record, paleontology, in Darwin's time. Now we know much more, and what we know also supports evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of uh, biochemists, um, have you observed a bigger uh, descent from evolution among biochemists than other, in other fields? That's what I've been noticing for the past like decade or so. I don't know if it's just a fluke or... It's, it's, since you do biochemistry uh, too, you might know the field better than I do. Is it more common among biochemists to be? No, I, no, I, no, no, I really don't think so. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you might be thinking of Michael Behe. Not just him. A, yeah, he is yeah, like. Yeah, who is, a, who is a professor, a professor of biochemistry at a university in the United States. And, and Michael, in the trial that I mentioned from 2005, he oh, was sort of the. He was sort of the opposing witness for me. Um, um, and there are a couple other people who have picked this up, but within the field of biochemistry, um, you will find uh, almost no dissent from the, from, from the idea of evolution. Um, when I do see people who have technical credentials, like a, a doctorate degree, who are opposing evolution, I find that more often that they more often they are in physics or engineering. Um, yeah, especially, in <laughs> yeah, especially in engineering, because of course, what engineers do is they design things. Yes, and, actually, I'll come to that in a bit. Yeah. And, and since they're used to the idea that complex systems like a computer or a television set, that complex systems have designers, 
when they realize, and remember they're engineers, when they realize how complex living things are, they say, oh, must have had a designer. Now that's not an argument that's, that's even worth considering, but th those, are the, those are the people that I see more often than not Maybe. Who yeah, are opposing maybe in engineering, it might be a little more. Uh, yeah. When I said biochemistry, I was thinking more about uh, basic sciences. You know, in applied sciences, definitely. Yeah. In, yeah, in sure. medicine, too, to be honest, you know, uh, if they're not taught from an evolutionary perspective, that's what we're right. seeing in Turkey. You know, you're teaching uh, the anatomy of humans, and it's, like, amazing. And if you don't give any evolutionary context, the obvious uh, conclusion that they make is there must be a designer for this. But... Before I go into that, uh, if someone listens to you, you know, uh, being at courts, fighting with creationism, you know, uh, dispersing evolution and, and all of these uh, heretic, <laughs> heretic behaviors, uh, they would think that you are an atheist. Uh, if you haven't changed your position, last time I checked, you weren't an atheist. Um, uh, correct me if it's wrong. So... I'm curious how you re uh, reconcile, because some of our audience members ask too, like, how do you reconcile, um, you know, humans cre being created specially and all the verses in Bible and there are uh, verses in Quran that seemingly clash this opinion? How do you really reconcile the two? Well, um, I will confirm that I am still a practicing Roman Catholic, so I am a Christian, mm -hmm. um, and many scientists are. Um, it is also true that many of my scientific colleagues are not. So many are agnostic or many are atheist. Um, that's never a problem in the practice of science because science itself is, is the closest thing we have on this planet to a universal language, a universal culture. So if I am collaborating with a scientist who is an atheist and another one who is a Muslim and another one who is a Buddhist, it's not a problem because we're talking about science itself and science is really quite different from religious faith. Um, I would also point out that one of the most important scientists in the United States, especially in the pandemic, is Dr. Francis Collins who is the director of our National Institutes of Health. And that's probably the single most important biological research organization in the United States. And Francis Collins is an evangelical Christian um, and a, a very strong supporter of evolution, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that can certainly be done. Now you asked me, how do you reconcile uh, it, faith with evolution, especially given verses in the Bible and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to steal a response from Dr. Collins. <laughs> and when he was asked the same question, he says, if two ideas are not in conflict, they do not need to be reconciled. So he would say that his faith, his Christian faith, I would say his Abrahamic faith, is not in conflict with evolution, and I would say the same thing. Now, let's talk about, you mentioned verses in the Bible, and I'm not sure um, how familiar your audience is with what we consider to be the Christian Bible, but the Christian Bible is an amalgam of books written at different times by different people for different audiences. So it is not at all like the Holy Quran, which is a single authorship uh, document. Um, so the Christian Bible is almost an historical collection. And a number of these books make up the Torah, which are the oldest books that are also accepted by Jews. Uh, and of course, they contain not just the creation story with Adam and Eve, who are, of course, also mentioned in the Quran, but also Father Abraham. Uh, and Abraham being the patriarch of all Abrahamic peoples. Uh, and that includes Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Um, so these, all these books are there. But it's important, and this is something I always tell my Christian friends, to recognize the Bible is not a single book that was given us miraculously. It is a highly edited library. And there are, for example, some absolutely beautiful books of poetry. One of my favorite 
is called the Song of Solomon. Um, my Protestant brothers and sisters call it the Canticle of Canticles. And it's a series, quite frankly, of love poems written by King Solomon. And many of them are quite erotic um, in terms of their, this is really true. Uh, when my wife and I were married, um, the priest allowed us to pick out Bible verses to have read. And I picked several verses from the Song of Solomon. <laughs> and my, my, my conservative Roman Catholic relatives were scandalized because they said, where did you ever find this? And I said, it's in the Bible. And they said, what? Um, then there are other books, which frankly are historical accounts. So the book's called Kings and the book of the Maccabees relate to actual battles between the Israelites and other people in the Middle East. So these are historical books. Then there are what I would call figurative books. So one of those is the book of Job. And the book of Job, I think, is one of the finest meditations on the nature of good and evil that has ever been written in any religious context. And then finally, let's take the book of Genesis because that is what causes many people problems with evolution. Well, I'm not a Bible scholar, but my understanding of the origin of the book of Genesis is that it was written during the Babylonian captivity of the Hebrew people. And the purpose of the book of Genesis was to explain how the Hebrew conception of God was different from that of the gods, plural, of their Babylonian captors. Uh, in the Babylonian tradition, there were good gods and evil gods. So the reason there is evil on this planet, on the earth, is because of the mix of good and evil involved in the creation. Um, the Hebrew conception, however, and this is also, uh, all Abrahamic faiths share this, is that creation was good. So, God or Allah or Jehovah created virtue and created goodness and that evil comes into the world by virtue of mankind's uh, rejection of God's plan. In other words, evil is something we do, not something that was originally present in the creation. And I think the book of Genesis does that very well. I mean, what you see are the first human beings in there, I consider them to be figurative rather than actual. The first human beings being given everything and still turning to evil. Um, and, you know, the whole history of mankind shows that, I'm sorry, that's what we do. And we do it again and again and again. So, um, so I regard Genesis, and I think uh, most contemporary Christians do, as a figurative document that writes about the, create, uh, the relationship between human beings and our creator. I don't regard it as scientific history, first of all, because the scientific history that's in there is wrong. The order of creation is wrong. Um, and then the other thing is, no one was present at the creation of the universe. So there was no one to write this down. And again, the fact that the book of Genesis was written uh, about 4,000 years ago should tell you right away that it's not an eyewitness account of anything. And therefore, I think that is really the proper way to understand it. So every, to me, every element of scripture, it, whether you are a person of faith or not a person of faith, has to be interpreted properly, meaning who wrote it, when did they write it, and for what purpose did they write it? And in the case of the Bible, um, what we call the Bible as Christians, every book has a different purpose in a different time. And I, um, I would point out, and other Christians have pointed this out as well, is that the, the authors or the author of Genesis, the book of Genesis and the early books of the Bible, um, imposed on that narrative their own understanding of cosmology and the universe. This is a pre-scientific age. And therefore, in my view, it profanes the Bible, the Torah, and the Quran, it profanes them to subject them to the tests of science. That's not how they were written. That's not their purpose. I see. Well, some sort of um, 
uh, reformism is required for sure to um, say that, you know, because th th what you're saying won't go well with absolutists, right? If they take the word, oh, as a word absolutely. of God. Yeah. And, and for example, you mentioned that these are written by or put into a book by humans and this, they're like uh, accounts of human beings, basically. But, you know, in, in the case of Islam, for example, that is the word of God. It's not written by humans. So there shouldn't be any errors in it. Not one error. So, uh, but this obviously in parts clashes if you take it in an absolute manner that that sentence, you know, uh, directly as, as a sentence of a, a, a factual statement that contradicts with uh, science and actually what Islamic scholars do is also what you are saying. It's one figurative speech. That's a very powerful way to diffuse it, basically. And two, you know, uh, we have to realize that it's it's a historical document. So it was being told to those people instead of as a universal fact. So um, yeah, I, let, let, let me add one thing to that. And, and I would mm -hmm. I would not presume to mm -hmm. speak to a Turkish Turkish audience about oh, the yes, intentions, yes. About, about the intentions of the prophet. But I will, but I will speak about, uh, I will speak about Jesus, and I often ask Christians who say that every, every word in the gospel, the four books that we have now about the life of Jesus has to be scientifically correct, mm -hmm. and my question to them is, why did Jesus come? Why did he live? Was it to teach us how to save our souls and to live a righteous life? Or was it to teach us nuclear physics, differential <laughs> equations, and molecular biology? You know very well in the Christian context that Jesus came for the first purpose, not for the second. And that is why I do not look to the Christian Bible for scientific principles. Yes. So that is very common in uh, Islamic scholars, too. You know, this is not a book of science. What it uh, mentions about the universe must be true uh, and it has to be you didn't like the word reconcile but i'll still use it reconciled with what science <laughs> says uh so we must be understanding this wrong is the sure. common you know way to go about it um and and then you know it is possible if you take this path and i think the crucial thing here is to emphasize that we can't bend science to match religion uh, I think that is the most common error that people make. They bend science, like denying evolution, to match it to religion instead of trying to understand what the religions say to infer, ah, okay, this must mean this about yeah. evolution because we know evolution is true. And I think it's hard uh, for people to make that uh, leap, though. So maybe yes, that's it why. is. It is. It is yeah. always a mistake, whether for political re reasons or religious reasons, it is always a mistake to tell scientists what they must discover. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, and then and limit them uh, based on that. So, uh, speaking of ways to um, uh, prove God, let's say, and or more importantly, uh, prove that uh, evolution is false. A very, very common argument that we have here here in Turkey is to use a pet. You know, you mentioned it in this in your uh, uh, presentation or in your Q&A section, too, that a pen is so wonderfully created uh, that without a part of this, it would never be able to work. And um, if you look at the pen, you would see that it's made for a purpose. Same thing applies for all uh, living things. Therefore, all living things must have a creator. Now, obviously... This is an, uh, a, a different version of William Paley's um, argument uh, for, uh, you know, the uh, watch, watchmaker argument, we should say. The, uh, if you were walking on a uh, hill, if you hit a stone, you might not think that it has a creator. But if you hit a, a watch, you know, it's so de much designed for a purpose that it must have a creator. So what do you think? When people come to you and say everything that humans create has a purpose, has, is very well designed, and I will take you even further by saying it might even have errors. They deny that having errors doesn't, you know, uh, uh, invalidates 
that a god created it maybe god wanted it with Ares. so that's that's solvable so um therefore humans with all of their errors and all the living things and all the universe must have a creator too well for one thing of course as a christian you already believe that but you believe that in a different way that it he used methods to uh, to create but still i want to hear your uh response to that well when you take a pen or a pencil you are taking an object that you know a priori was created <laughs> was yes, designed so you're taking an object that you know had a certain amount of engineering in it, that you know has parts which are designed to fit together, uh, and you are marveling at its complexity as if complexity was the proof of intelligent design. Now, we know this is design, so there's no argument there. Um, how about living things? Well, living things can do certain things that pens cannot. One of those is they are self-replicating, which is to say they a bacterium can divide, a plant can pollinate itself and produce seeds, animals can mate and produce offspring. So what that means is if you regard, for example, the genetic blueprint of an organism as its design, you have to account for the fact that living things have a genetic blueprint that can change. It can change by mutation. It can change by genetic recombination. Neither one of those involve a designer. They are basically a property of life itself. And when you come to the recognition of how genetic recombination works, how mutation works, and how flexible the genetic code is, it becomes apparent that living things can, the, the, it becomes apparent that the so-called design of living things can change independent of any outside design or outside intervention. So that life itself is capable of self-generating the complexity um, that far surpasses anything you see in a human design object. And they do this precisely by the mechanism of natural selection and generation of genetic diversity. So once again, complexity does not imply design. It only implies it in the case where you know an object was designed. And then finally, um, you know, one of the reasons I gave the examples that, that I did today from the fossil record and from the human genome is because they document the process of evolution and they also document the fact that evolution can produce new organs and new structures without outside intervention. And I think once you have shown that, you have sort of mastered the design argument. So can we say that what you are, what you believe or what you think is a more deistic argument where the God, because you say you believe in the God, Therefore, God must have done something for this universe. And that is to create the laws that make things do what they do. Can we tie it like that? Well, let's put let's put it this way. Now you are now you are interrogating me as a yeah, person. I am. Hey, <laughs> yes. rather, rather than rather than rather than as a scientist. Okay. Yes. So so, so let me put it this way. And I'm going to I'm going to quote Einstein, not because Einstein was a believer, which he was not. Mm -hmm. Albert Einstein did not believe in a God, even though he mentioned God all the time. Yes. But one of the things that, that Einstein wrote that has always impressed me is that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Exactly, yeah. In other words, it, the most astonishing thing about the universe is that it seems to be organized in such a way that we can figure it out. Now, why should that be? And, and, and I have no answer other than the idea that the reason that there seems to be a logic and an intelligible structure to the universe is because there is an intelligence behind the universe, that it was uh, the, the work of an intelligent, creative being. Now, um, you may reject that argument, and many philosophers would. 
So I'm not going. To, I'm not going to interrogate your atheism. That's, that's uh, or, completely fine. Yeah. Or, or or ask you that sort of thing. But the very fact that the universe seems to make sense, that it seems to be organized in a way that is intelligible to us, is indeed Einstein said incomprehensible. Um, I would not say it is proof of the existence of God, but what I would say is it's consistent with the existence of an intelligent creator. Now, um, you know, having 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 taken that point, you said, do you take a deist point of view, which is to say there is a creator of intelligence behind the universe, mm -hmm. and I'll put it in a more colorful way, that you had a God who created everything, and ever since then, he has been asleep on his front porch. Uh, <laughs> while we humans just go ahead and... And the answer to that is no, I do not. Um, and that is I, I, I pray, I attend religious services, and I do so because I believe that God can intervene in my life. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. I do not mean, like, for well, um, when I was a graduate student, and I think you can probably relate to this, <laughs> I, was, I was always very short of money. I was always absolutely broke. And <laughs> I, I discovered very quickly that it did no good to pray that in the morning when I woke up, there would be a stack of $100 bills on the nightstand next to my bed. No, I it never didn't. works that way, would it? No, does it? It never works. It never works. <laughs> if, if it did work, everyone would be religious. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, that's second. <laughs> but, but the other thing is, um, what I did learn is that, in a sense, um, I could pray, and this is something I believe, for God to give me the strength mm -hmm. to find a way out of my problems, to help me understand the righteous course. What, what is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. Which I think is the essential moral question for all people, whether they are religious or not. What is the right thing to do? And the very fact that we human beings, I think, have a sense of morality. And what I mean by that is not just don't do sex, drugs, and rock and rolls, but, <laughs> my, mora but, but by morality, I mean ethics. Um, I mean, you know, basically what is fair and unfair? Um, how is it appropriate to treat other human beings? This sort of thing. The very fact that we have that ethical sense may be the pro product of evolution, but it, 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 it convinces me that there actually is such a thing as good and evil, that there is a right way to live and that there are wrong ways to live. There are, there are evil things that we can do to other people and we see them throughout history and we see them in the world today. Why do we think they're evil? The answer is because we have this innate sense of right and wrong without which society would not be possible. And to some extent, to me, that's consistent with the idea of a creator. I understand. And this was not to, uh, I apologize if you felt uncomfortable. With oh, I, I, or, oh, I didn't oh, mean to interrogate you know, your fate. <laughs> you, you know me better than that. You're not going to make me feel uncomfortable. No, that's great. Thank you. That's good to know. Why I was asking this is I'm going to ask a couple questions about intelligent design. And I want to see if the only, basically, the distinction between an intelligent designer and your belief mm. is an intelligent designer just says, God tells how the law will act and it can change it, or he or she can change it at any time. Whereas you believe God would never intervene with the way the law works um, because he already made it perfect, let's say. Some people believe in that. So there's no need to, for changing that law. So I wanted to kind of uh, probe a little to see what the difference there is between a person who believes in God uh, and a person who believes in God and that he believes that, okay, evolution might be true, fine, but God is controlling. God, uh, God is in the, you know, uh, at the driving wheel of this uh, law and he can change it at any time. Uh, when, you, you make when, you said, when, you, when you said God is at the driving wheel, do your, does your Turkish audience know that you just took a phrase from a country music song called Jesus Take the Wheel? <laughs> yes. I don't think okay. they do, but I, I know that. <laughs> okay, so that's so that's a good one. Well, oh, first of all, um, if 
the phrase intelligent design meant that there is meaning and purpose and order to the universe and to human existence, I would be advocating for intelligent design. Okay. However, certainly in the United States and in other Western countries, that is not what is meant by intelligent design. What is meant by intelligent design is that the mechanism proposed for evolution does not work, yeah. that living things by and large do not have common ancestry, and that every single complex living thing was intentionally designed and created by a force operating outside of nature and beyond our understanding. That is actually what is meant by intelligent design. And that's so, why I completely reject it. And in, so, yeah, you are rejecting intelligent design as a rebranded creationism. Oh, it is. Uh, I guess uh, Eugene Scott actually made this um, scale. I, I bet you know it. And there she talks about theistic evolution, uh, you know, different kinds of intelligent design. I guess, yeah. you know, I'm just asking this because if you bring an intelligent designer here, they will find all of all these convoluted ways to uh, chain or, you know, Uh, put a distance between themselves and creationism and uh, try to kind of force you into, look, you believe in the very same thing. It's just in a different way because it's a broad term, you know, you can, and, and it's evolving, to be honest. Since your case, since intelligent design was shut down, it evolved just like it did from creationism to intelligent right. design. It has moved on. So that's why I'm trying to see what is next. How will you, uh, you know, are they going in the right direction? Maybe they are, you know. Uh, because we are seeing that in Turkey, some people who were ardent um, rejectors, I will say, of evolution are now more okay with the fact that, and they, with the fact, and they're trying to again reconcile that with their own beliefs and give a more coherent, uh, uh, you know, understanding of God and evolution and unite them in a single. And they were intelligent designers, not creationists. So that's why I, maybe if you well, want to clarify. Yeah, I, well, well, I could always ask you um, uh, uh, a question in the context of Turkey, which is what what effect has the recent mis misfortune that the person who uses the name Harun <laughs> Yaha is yeah. going to have, is going to have on the anti evolution movement? Um, yeah. But I but I, at least right now I'm not going to go there. Um, okay. What one of the reasons, and, and I always try to make this clear because you are right that the advocates of intelligent design always say, we're not creationists, don't call us that and so forth. But you know, I, I actually, many years ago, made a presentation about this explaining why the advocates of intelligent design are creationists, which if you say, uh, let's take an organism, let's take a worm. And worms may seem simple, but they're not. They're enormously complicated. We, do, you know, we can sequence all the DNA of the worm, Cenorebditis elegans, Um, we know every gene that's in it. We know every cell that's in it. We still don't have a complete understanding of how this organism works. So you might say, well, that's proof that it was designed. Yeah. Um, no, it's proof that it was created. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. If I decide to design something, it means I'm drawing a plan. I'm putting a blueprint together and so forth. But then to go from my design to the actual object, which is to say the living worm, requires an act of creation. And the example that I use that all Americans understand is the design of an enormous monument in the Western United States called Mount Rushmore, which is a mountain that has the faces of four American presidents carved on the side of the mountain. It will not surprise you to learn that President Trump actually fantasize <laughs> about being the fifth one. I don't think he's going to make it, okay? But on the other hand, so everyone, would say, everyone would say, ah, that's proof of design, and it is, because the designer of Mount Rushmore was a, an immigrant sculptor named Gutzon Borglum, and Borglum did design Mount Rushmore. And there are his sketches, the models in his studio, but then... What Borglum had to do was to create Mount Rushmore. And over 35 years, this beautiful monument was carved out of the side of the mountain. Was it designed? Yes. 
But to put design into practice requires an act of creation. And that is true whether you are a painter, an architect, or a sculptor. So when you make the claim that the complexity of living organisms was designed, you are also saying that those organisms were created. And that makes you a creationist by any standard. And you don't believe that? Oh, I absolutely positively don't believe that. My understanding, even as a religious person, my understanding of the process of evolution is absolutely no different from yours or any other colleague of mine who is not religious, which, which is to say, um, you know, evolution is a capability that is built into living things. And I would also add that the capacity for life is built into the physics and chemistry of nature itself. Uh, life is a physical and chemical phenomena. There's absolutely no question about that. That's how we investigate it. That's how cell biology works. That's how molecular biology works. Um, the question is, you know, why should living matter be capable of life? Um, and again, if you're a non-believer, you just say, it is. We have no answer to that. If you are a person of faith, then the answer is because the universe did have uh, an ultimately intelligent creator who wanted it to be capable of life. And that's why we have the world we do. I see. Um, moving on to a little bit of intelligent design, and I'll try to wrap it up. But I don't want to uh, keep you here for uh, too long. Um, but uh, you actually, this one was asked in the Q&A section too. You defended uh, evolution against intelligent designers uh, in the Denver case. What, what was the name? Kurtz Miller? Um, it, Kitz Miller versus Dover. Kitz Miller Dover. Yeah, Dover case. And um, and uh, how was the feeling there? Did you like feel like you're in Inquisition where, where Galileo was charged, like the Inquisition of, of of the previous centuries, or did you feel like no, this is just a normal procedure, and I'm you know a part of it? Did, was there a feeling like that? <laughs> okay, so the first thing you have to understand is that by nature I am a fairly competitive person. Mm -hmm. um, I was a, I was a competitive athlete as a young man. I was a competitive mm -hmm. swimmer and I loved and still love competition. Mm -hmm. So I um, am very happy to engage in competition. Uh, prior to the trial, I had debated scientific creationist and intelligent design proponents many, many times. So that's the first thing. The second thing, <coughs> pardon me, is the Kitzmiller case came about, the case in Dover, because of the intelligent design curriculum that the school board imposed, which was objected to by 11 parents of students in there. And it was those parents who went to court to basically argue this was, a, um, uh, this was an offense against their First Amendment rights as Americans under the First Amendment to our Constitution, which is probably the most important amendment because it guarantees freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Um, when I was asked to testify in that trial, um, I um, came to uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where the trial was going to be, four days before the trial began. And on the trial started on a Monday. On a Saturday evening, we had a small get-together at the home of one of the parents. And all of those plaintiffs, those 11 parents, were there. And I got to meet them personally. I got to meet the attorneys who were there for the case. It was clear to me that those 11 parents had taken an enormous risk because there were many people in their own community who hated them for having filed this court case against the school board. Uh, Tammy Kitzmiller herself went out to her mailbox one morning and there was a piece of paper addressed to her with a rubber band around it and inside there was a bullet. Um, and and the, the, the implication of that was very clear to her. Um, and this is a small town, so these people... Um, had to interact with those who were angry at them every single day. And I thought, boy, um, 
these are wonderful people and they are courageous people. And I want to go into that courtroom and fight for them. Um, and that's exactly what I was ready to do. Um, the other thing is I worked with an attorney um, who was going to question me first. His name was Vic Walchek. Vic is from the American Civil Liberties Union, which is an organization that promotes the First Amendment, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and so forth. Um, Vic and I are both from the American state of New Jersey. Uh, people from New Jersey have sort of a you know, smart-ass, wise guy attitude. We like to fight. We're very contentious. Um, and Vic and I were determined that not only were we going to make a strong case in the courtroom, but we were going to have some fun doing it. So to be perfectly honest, I was on the stand for, I was on the witness stand in the courtroom over two days for about nine hours. And I have to tell you, I enjoyed every minute <laughs> of it, especially, especially when the opposing attorney was trying to cross-examine me because his questions were obvious. They were easily answered. And I was, you know, he actually helped me to explain some of the misconceptions of the intelligent design movement. So no, I did not feel beleaguered. I did not feel put upon. I had a blast. I had a very good <laughs> That is a great attitude for such a huge task. And the judge was appointed by Bush, I believe, right? Yes. The, the, the judge, his name is John Jones III. Mm -hmm. He is a lifelong member, member of the Republican Party. So he wasn't and, biased towards you or anything like that, I don't think. Pardon me? He wasn't biased towards you or anything like oh, that. I mean, well, he, well he was, you might think he would be because he was a member of the Republican Party. Um, in, in the U.S., federal judges, this is a federal court, are usually recommended by one of their state's senators. And the senator who recommended Judge Jones was former Senator Rick Santorum. Oh. And Rick Santorum is one of the most conservative figures in the Republican Party. And then Jones was appointed to the bench by President George W. Bush. That's the second George Bush. So he is, in fact, politically very conservative. But I have to tell you that the trial helped to restore my faith in the American judicial system because Judge Jones was incredibly fair. Um, and he was uh, he came to he came to that case with an open mind. And he wrote an extraordinary opinion at the end of the case, which was scientifically literate, very well written, and in some cases, actually funny, um, <laughs> because he talked about how absurd the arguments of the other side actually were. And uh, three or four years after the trial, um, I got a chance to be um, at the same conference as Judge Jones. We were both speaking. And I actually did not know whether it was proper for a person in the case uh, to speak to the judge afterwards. But after we both gave a presentation, he said, let's go out and have a beer. Um, <laughs> so we sat down at a bar and we had a nice discussion with each other. And he explained to me that he knew nothing about biology. And therefore, he went, when he was assigned this case, he realized two things. One is he had to learn some biology. And number two is, he thought, you know, this might be the most important case I will ever try. Probably. Well, yeah. and he was determined to do a good job. And by good job, I don't mean to come to a certain decision. I mean to really listen to all the facts and to render a decision that was consistent with those facts. And that, um, that made me feel that even the judges who are appointed by people like George W. Bush, or for that matter, by Donald Trump. Once they get on the court, they still feel as though they have an obligation to fairness yeah. and truth. That's what and, we're and, seeing in the Supreme Court too, I believe. I yes, that. exactly. And of course, because you've been in the United States, you know that after our election last year, uh, Trump did everything he could to get courts all over the country, 60 mm -hmm. courts, to overturn 
various elements of the election. And in many cases, those courts had judges that he appointed. <laughs> and without exception, the courts turned him away. That is um, so, so good. So, so that really gives me some faith in the American judicial system. This was like the second Scopes case. Can we say that? Um, lots of people have called it Scopes 2. It's exactly version right. Version 2. Yeah, what will yeah, be version I, 3, I wonder? I, I hope there's never a version 3. <laughs> never, never. Yeah. And, <laughs> like and, a world war. Yeah, and, and, and you may know there have, yeah, hopefully no more world wars either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, four books have been written about the trial. So mm -hmm. there are four books and two TV series, one by the BBC and the other one by the American uh, PBS program, Nova. Uh, yeah. The Nova program The Nova program is really excellent. It is stellar, yeah. It is really good. And, and in that court, let, let's show our audience some uh, sample of it. You brought a mousetrap. I, or did you, did you bring it to the court too, or was it just an argument? On the on the very first day of the trial, <laughs> um, I naturally I was dressed with a nice shirt and tie, yeah. and a nice suit jacket because that's what you do when you go to court. Yeah. And I was using a modified mousetrap as a tie clip, <laughs> and, and and that's how I walked into court. And my potential opponent, Michael Behe, was in the courtroom, although he did not testify that day. And I made sure that he saw the mousetrap tie clip. <laughs> I can tell you, you didn't like it very much. Uh, but the um, so, what was the point of it? Like, what are you showing there? So, so right here, because you warned me that you would ask me about <laughs> the mousetrap, I brought a mousetrap. And a mousetrap um, is a uh, it. The mousetrap is used uh, by Michael Behe, an intelligent design proponent as uh, an anal analogy to what living systems are like. And a mousetrap has typically five parts. It has a base plate, it has a hammer, it has a spring to drive the hammer, it has a place to hold the bait, and then it has a little catch that you put into the bait so that when some poor mouse um, tries to eat it, uh, it releases the hammer and boy, captures the poor little mouse. I won't go further than that. <laughs> yeah, now, let's, let's leave that there. His argument was, here are the five parts. If any part is missing, the mouse pad does not work. Can't catch any mice with it. Okay, fair enough. Then he says, living things are just like that. And he gives as an example the flagella that certain bacteria have, the blood clotting system, the various proteins of the immune system. And he says, they're all composed of multiple well-matched parts. And if any one of those parts is missing, the system does not work. Now, the reason, he says, that's an argument against evolution is because evolution cannot produce a system, let's say, with 10 parts all at once because there's no selective advantage to those parts. And if the parts all have to be put together, before they have selective value, before they're useful. Only an intelligent designer could do that. Evolution could not evolve one, two, three, four parts, knowing that later on they would be useful because evolution has no foresight. And, and that is true, by the way. Evolution does not evolve proteins thinking, well, a million years from now, I'll evolve the other parts and they'll turn out to be useful. It doesn't work that way. Therefore, Complex things like the flagellum or like the blood clotting system could never have evolved. That's Behe's proof. Now, here's where he's wrong. Where he's wrong and is before that, you move, continue, yeah. this is what he calls irreducible complexity. Yes, that's right. I should have used that term. Thank you for bringing it up. So he yeah. says a complex system is irreducibly complex because the removal of any one part effectively causes it to stop functioning. So what I did was I simply took an ordinary mousetrap, which is an irreducibly complex system, according to Behe. And I pulled off the bait holder and I pulled off the catch. Now, I haven't done it on this one. So that yeah, all I had left were three parts, the base, the spring, and the clamp. Now, it turns out that's correct. You cannot catch any mice with it. But do you know what? It makes a perfectly good tie clip. So what I did was to use that three-part mouth strap. I don't have a tie on now, but I clipped it to hold my tie. Now, it is not a very elegant tie clip, but it works 
but it works great. It holds the tie in position. Now, the reason I did that was to say, look, you are right, which is if you take parts away, the system does not function for the purpose for which it was designed, which is to catch mice. However, parts of the system are still useful for other purposes. And it turns out that when then you look at the uh, other systems that Behe has advocated, I'll take the blood clotting system or the flagellum. The bacterial flagellum has about 40 different proteins. And again, his argument is that if you take any one part away, it stops functioning. Therefore, the whole thing must have been designed as a unit. Well, it turns out that in certain bacteria, not just one part is missing, not just 10, but 30 parts are missing. And all that is left is 10 of those proteins. Now, those 10 proteins no longer form a flagellum. But are they still useful? The answer turns out to be yes, just like the stripped down mousetrap as a tie clip. They form something called the type 3 secretory system, which is a system that can sort of inject proteins into other cells. It's actually a very important part of the sort of pathogenesis of certain types of bacteria. So even the system, and I can do the same thing with blood clotting, even the systems that Behe said were irreducibly complex because if you remove parts, they don't work anymore. They turn out not to be irreducibly complex because you can remove parts and the individual parts still have function. That's how evolution builds these complex systems, which is by taking individual parts that have another function in another context and then duplicating the genes, combining them, and producing new functions from the combined structure. And you can even take apart the mousetrap even further to use it for, say, paperweight, right? You can use it for paperweight. You can use it for kindling. <laughs> um, and you can use it, and I joked about this, you can use it as a spitball launcher, like a little, catap like a little well, catapult. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because when I listened to him, he uh, trying to respond to this, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not trying to bring him into the discussion, but it's like sure. anything can become a paperweight. And that's exactly true. As you divide it even further, it should be more uh, universal, more easily used so that it can be repurposed as it goes based on yeah. the selection force. It's like, so this, this makes me think uh, my next, about my next question. Can they not see it? Can they not see how obvious the answer to this uh, argument is? So do you think these creationists, not all of them maybe, but are they, or intelligent designers are they sincere in their arguments in their beliefs and um what do you what do you see in there okay well i i'm gonna have to make this the last question that i okay. answer because i have some other things i have to do and of i've course, been online yes, i've been you. online for about two hours okay yes. so so are they sincere um many of my colleagues believe they are not so many of my colleagues would say well they're just in it because it's a good way to make money or it's a way to attract fame for yourself or something along those lines. Um, I know Michael Behe at this point, I think, very well. I also know some of the other people who were involved in the so-called creation science movement. I think they are profoundly sincere. I think they are wrong. They are misled. They are self-deluding but I think they are sincere. And I'll just give you one example about this. I know, I know that Behe is sincere. Um, many years ago, this is in the early 1980s, um, three times I debated a person named Henry Morris. And Henry Morris was the founder of the Institute for Creation Research. He was a so-called creation scientist. He'd written several books and was very, very famous. And we debated three times. And one of those debates, which was a very important one, was in Tampa, Florida, which is a very large American city in Florida. Um, and the, the debate was important because the school board was on the verge of telling their science teachers that they had to teach scientific creationism along with evolution in biology classes. So I was challenged to debate Dr. Morris 
uh, at Tampa. It was a very public event. There were th- a, more than a thousand people came to the debate and it was carried live on a local radio station so that everybody in the city could hear it. And, uh, you know, in, in all honesty, um, I pretty much took him apart during the debate. I, 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 I know that I won the debate in part because the school board changed its mind and in part because people afterwards will say, well, Dr. Morris was not at his best. So that's why, <laughs> that's why the evolutionists, so forth and so on. But in any event, and this is a true story, um, our hosts had put us up in the same motel, the same small hotel outside town. And I sort of knew that, but w- whatever. Uh, the debate was Saturday night. So I got up early Sunday morning and um, I had already discovered that there was a Catholic church uh, about a half a mile from the uh, uh, motel. And uh, us Catholics tend to go to uh, Sunday mass very early in the morning, you might say, just to get it over with. Um, so, so I so I got up and I walked down the road. I think it was a 7.30 mass. So I attended mass, religious services, and then I walked back to the motel and they had a nice little breakfast shop, a breakfast restaurant. And I walked in there um, and there was Henry Morris sitting at a table finishing breakfast. And I thought, what the heck? <laughs> so, so, okay. so I walked over and I asked if I could join him. And he was a very gracious man. So he said, yes. And I sat down and I placed my order. And then I pointed something out to him. I said, you know, last night you brought up a couple of arguments against evolution. They concern things like the strength of the Earth's magnetic field or the amount of meteorite dust on the moon. These are both arguments for like a 6,000-year-old universe. Mm, And and I said, and, and as you know, I answered those arguments very easily with the facts. I showed that you were wrong. Um, do you really believe this stuff? Um, you know, the, the, how can you be sincere? In he was a geologist in arguing that the Earth is only six thousand years old. Where every time you brought it up, I was able to show scientific evidence that you were not true. That it was not true, and I expected him to say something cynical like, "Well, you know, that's what people you know so forth and so on." He didn't say that. He said, "Look, Ken." you're a Christian, you profess to be a Christian just as I am. And therefore what this means is we already know in advance what is true because God has told us that in the Bible. And therefore, even if the scientific evidence seems to contradict it, it is our obligation to find a way to speak up for the truth of the Bible. And you should understand that. So I came away from this believing, I think quite rightly, that he was absolutely sincere in his rejection of science or in his willingness to bend science to fit his religious convictions. That's exactly what we were talking about. Well, that was a great uh, example. And thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Miller. It was it was delightful. I can't uh, yeah. find words to describe it. Yeah, well, and... and, and- and thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is wonderful. Anytime, anytime. And um, see you next time, I, I should say. And have a great rest of your day. And thank you so much for everything you do for science. Thanks a lot. Maybe next time in Turkey. Take care. All right. Got it. Thank you so much. Well, that was the end of our uh, event. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Miller is a long friend, I should say. Uh, now and he he is an amazing character as you uh, can see um, he's a delightful man and he's done so much to advance science in his country and his efforts trickled down to other countries like Turkey and um, thanks to him we can do even more um, uh, this is not our last event as as we described at the beginning of the event this is a series of events we call uh, a month of evolution Uh, And actually, the next event will kick off the second half of our month of evolution. And we will have another delightful man, a little uh, like uh, more serious character, I should say, uh, Dr. Robert uh, Zubrin. And you will see what I mean by that. He's a uh, he has a harder persona, I should say. 
and um, uh, we will interview him about Mars. As you know, uh, Perseverance just landed on on Mars just about um, what nine days ago, eight days ago, and um, so we will ask him: Will Mars be the next home to uh, the evolution of humankind? And uh, he's an ardent supporter of uh, manned Mars missions, human flight to Mars. And he's a pioneer in the field. And we have uh, used his speeches, his ideas, his writings extensively in Evrimaji. So this will be the first time that we will interview Dr. Zubrin as a part of our collaboration with Boazici University um, a, a Science Club and Evrimaji group under that science club. And uh, tomorrow, if you have time, join us and we will talk about Mars and human evolution. Thank you so much for joining us today. See you next time.